Lawson, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that gets around, if you know what I mean. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community with the latest in legal marketing and law firm development. I'm Jake Sanders. He's Paul Julius. We're just sort of... We're getting around, <laughs> is what we're doing. You know what we're talking about. Opening up the calendar, seeing who Waltz is in. Uh, it's been a busy week, and because there's been conference after conference after conference, uh, one of them being Clio, uh, and we were lucky enough to get backstage passes, and that's why we're doing this episode. It's pretty incredible. So uh, maybe we should get get to it. You know what? Yeah, the- let's tell... What's on the show today? The show today, we're talking about Clio, uh, the just released 2020 legal trends report and highlights from Clio Cloud Conference 2020 that we were lucky enough to attend. And we are joined by none other than Jack Newton, CEO, co-founder of Clio, to get his takes on new developments at Clio, what we've learned from the past year and where we should be looking moving forward. And because he's a man with a schedule, we accelerate our research with a special high-speed edition of Five Questions We Ask Everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The Hot Take Buffet today is steaming away with the latest legal trends report from Clio. Um, This is amazing. Every year, well, for the past five years, uh, they've been making these jammies, and it's been amazing because they they just provide insights that you don't get. Uh, every, a lot of legal marketing, a lot of um, marketing in general, is sort of guesswork. <laughs> so without benchmarks or data, you don't know where you're at in the marketplace, who, who, who you're competing with. The Legal Trends Report is so useful, and this year was very useful, um, particularly because they hit on the pandemic. Um, Mm -hmm. It wasn't just in an isolated bubble, you know. uh, It wasn't... um, They addressed the marketplace realities. So I I really love this. Uh, If you can, go pick it up at Clio.com, and you can thumb along with us, but... Paul, this this is this 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 report is great. What what was what's your take away here? So there's a lot, and I I do want to kind of give them a little bit of an extra shout out. This is amazing that they're really kind of opening their database and sharing what they've learned, uh, mm-hmm. which is not something a lot of companies do. Mm-hmm. And you know, in in past years, we referenced their reports pretty heavily. Even in the the marketing side of things, we've used data that they've provided. Uh, to think, I, th- I think make some pretty accurate choices. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're not just saying, "Hey, here's a great thing." Like we've used this. This is this is valuable and tested information. Mm-hmm. Um, my hot take on it, though, particularly in in the face of uh, you know these uncertain times, or mm-hmm. whatever I've heard they are. Yes, whatever it is you may yeah um, you may want to say is that I'm not sure how much of this is a reflection of what's happening in the legal industry as much as it is a reflection of just business at large, Mm. you know, particularly in some of the things where we see like, okay, business dropped off. There was obviously people who were more suited to being remote were, were better able to adapt. But let me, let me run through the, the, just the different kind of parts here. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is, it's a 92 page report. So we're obviously not going to get through, you know, every single thing in here, but here's, here's what they address. How times of crisis affect legal. Aggregation of marginal gains. Firm success centers on clients. A new vision for cloud-based, client-centered legal practice. Addressing underserved legal markets. Uh, This is a real passion of Jack's. We find out later. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the future of law will be cloud-based by design. So quite a lot to uh, unpeel here. My take on it, one thing that came through uh, in different places, there was some amazing sessions at the uh, at the conference. One that really stood out for me was was Angela Duckworth, the, the author of Grit. Mm-hmm. Um, she's written a lot of you know talks about being gritty and 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 there was a, a point in her presentation when she was talking about um, athletes, experts, um, people who were who were striving and succeeding and and being determined and doing it in the face of you know really typically 
pretty long odds. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's tough to make it to the NFL or, you know, break a, a world record in a marathon. Okay. And what she said was that change for these these experts, when you practice, um, when you when you break something down and try and 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 build yourself back up better is that it's incremental. And what you should do is try and break things down into smaller processes which is kind of like what this report does Mm -hmm. and look for areas where you can improve, but a small thing and start doing those small things. Mm. Um, and, and to me, that's where a lot of this is, is that in these, in the face of change, in the face of uncertainty and, and maybe confusion and maybe not clear direction, you can still start making those little changes here and there and building on that. And that's, Mm. what's going to sustain. So that's, that was kind of my hot take. So what do you got? Well, so I, I think my, my whole take is, is I definitely everyone, you know, what Paul's saying is true. Um, it's useful. This is kind of a living, breathing document too. One of the things that Jack tells us is the way that they sampled the data is sort of more live, more real time, um, less precedent facing and more gaining sentiment in real time which which is actually whole it's a whole nother chapter that they keep opening up over at Clio. my whole take is about the thing itself and about the conference i just want to step back from all of this and say Clio makes software that's it as marketers if they wanted to market their product they could just say hey it's half off until wednesday they could just run a discount or something. Why do all this? Why would you even mess with this stuff? A conference, the, the largest legal conference gone virtual, why would you do that? Why would you book Questlove, Nathaniel Rateliff, and Seth Godin? You know, why would you do that if you just make software? Why would you make a legal trends report that talks about these marketplace dynamics that you were saying, well, a lot of these are just simple marketplace dynamics. Well, why would you even tell lawyers about this if all you do is make yeah. software? I think it's a, it's a huge win because they have created this place where we can all warm our hands around information and create relationships that end up being the marketing tools that will make, you know, the buildings that we create for tomorrow. And it's just odd that they talk about things, incremental gains, but they actually do things. And they're invested in changing the marketplace, not only for lawyers, but for clients. And it's really inspiring because they, they just make widgets, right? Don't they just make little knobs and doodads? Why would you ever waste this effort, this money, this time? Because you see it come back in the marketplace that you make better. And I just think it's an amazing thing. And I get a little goosebumps kind of thinking about it because they don't have to do this, but they do it and they do it exceedingly well. And we sit down with the CEO of Clio, who is more than just, you know, a coder because that is his background. Jack Newton is, is, is a computer guy. Why go here? Why do this? We find out, we dive into the ClioCon, we dive into the Legal Trends Report, we figure out these marginal gains, we talk about it. It's Lawson, it's Consult Webs, it's Jake, it's Paul, it's Jack Newton, and it's all going down right now. Let's go. Stay tuned as we continue on a very special episode of Lawson. The internet can be a cold and unforgiving place. Every day thousands of law firm websites go unvisited and unfairly labeled as worthless due to the inattention or misguided attempts at do-it-yourself marketing by their owners. Poor optimization and bad design principles have left these sites unable to realize the full potential of the digital landscape they're forced to exist in, and they're now trapped on page three of the search results in an endless cycle of bad management leading to poor results, leading to disillusionment and loss. There's hope for these neglected websites in the form of a digital marketing company focused exclusively on law firms. Since 1999, Consult Webs has helped hundreds of lawyers connect to thousands of clients across the country using sound marketing principles based off an exhaustive track record of marketing campaigns that have already proven to be successful. 
If your website is underperforming, call Consult Webs at 800 872 6590 and get the clicks it so desperately needs. Please don't let another day full of unvisited pages go by. Take that step and call today for them. And now, a lawsome interview. Jack Newton is an author, entrepreneur, and CEO slash co-founder of Clio, the undisputed leader in cloud-based legal technology, offering practice management, CRM, and client intake software. And here, in the midst of Clio Cloud 9, the world's biggest legal conference, gone virtual. Jack has carved out some time to sit with the Lawson Podcast. Jack, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, seriously, it's one of the best conferences we've attended uh, in our sweatpants. <laughs> so, and, and not been seen out by the security staff. Uh, totally. No, it's been amazing. Uh, so, Thank you. But there's been so much content. One of the things that's come out recently is this, the, the 2020 Legal Trends Report. So let's start with that. What went into this edition specifically, and, and why was it different than the, than the trends <laughs> reports right. previously? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. There was this, this thing called COVID that I've not heard everyone that. has heard of, but it did, it did impact the legal industry. Right. Joking aside, we, you know, this is our fifth year of doing the legal mm -hmm. trends report. And, right. you know, back in, in early March, when, when COVID hit North America in a, in a big way, we, you know, we sent our, our, our full Clio team, 500 worldwide employees home uh, to, to work from home. We closed our five offices, uh, they, they remain closed to this day. And, and one of our first thoughts after we'd kind of taken care of our own basic needs at, at Clio in terms of making sure our staff were supported and we could support our customers and so on was kind of looking outward to the industry and saying, what can we do to help the legal industry navigate this really, you know, unprecedented uh, event? And we tore up what at that point had been our game plan for the legal trends report for 2020 and said, let's redeploy all the machinery that we normally put around the legal trends report to live real time reporting, essentially, mm -hmm. both from a anonymized and aggregated Clio app data perspective, as well as our quantitative and qualitative consumer research and legal research to give to give the legal industry a perspective on what's going on. So we published the full legal trends report uh, as part of my opening keynote on, on Tuesday mm -hmm. of the, the Clio Cloud Conference. Mm -hmm. But we had been doing monthly briefings starting in, in March to both bar leaders and, and thought leaders in the legal industry, as well as our, uh, our broader customer base and, and even non-customer base, giving them a snapshot of, hey, here's how things are playing out in real time, essentially. Uh, and we're able to show, for example, you know, back in, in April, we saw legal demand fall off a cliff. Uh, new matter creation was down more than 33%. We saw billing volume drop by almost the same amount just a, a couple of months later. Uh, we were able to contrast how different states with different COVID responses, different social distancing uh, and shelter in, in place provisions how they fared, you know, from a legal perspective and, and how that informed how legal demand, you know, bounced back or, or didn't as the, the case the might be. Point. So everything about this year's legal trends report has, has been informed by, by COVID, but, but also, you know, a point I make in my, my, my keynote at ClioCon as well is it, it's not just about what the immediate impacts of COVID are, but if we look at COVID as this, important moment for the legal industry where it's going through an evolutionary progression. You know, this is a, a, a geological event uh, for the legal industry where I think we're actually seeing lawyers really diverge in terms of lawyers that kind of understand what the future looks like and how they're going to have to pivot the way they deliver legal services to, to accommodate and to recognize this new reality. Uh, and part of the legal trends report is painting a bit of a vision for what we think that new reality looks like. And if you're a lawyer trying to figure out how do I make sense of this, this crazy reality that I'm surrounded by, we, we paint, I think, a pretty clear picture of what the future could look like. And it's all supported by 
uh, by data that shows us both how certain law firms are thriving and quantitatively how consumer sentiment is shifting and how lawyers can ideally meet uh, meet the client demand that that is emerging amidst COVID-19. Well, I, one of the things that really stood out to us in the report was um, 56% of consumers believe most legal manners can be handled remotely and would prefer to handle it via video call. Um, right. And as you mentioned in your keynote, this is a complete reversal of consumer behavior. So can you kind of unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, I, I think what we've seen is a massive and what I describe as a tectonic shift, you know, in in consumer attitudes around consuming everything, right? And and lawyers should recognize that, you know, what they're seeing in terms of the change in consumer behavior around legal services and the delivery of legal services is just a microcosm of how it's shifted all sorts of other industries as well, right? Like we've seen, I think the macro perspective on COVID-19 is that it's accelerated a lot of trends that were already underway and, and accelerated those trends maybe by a decade or more and compressed those into a fan, handful of, of weeks or months. So let, let's look at the retail industry as an example, right? Like things were moving to online buying, things were moving to e-commerce, uh, the, the physical mall, the retail mall was a dying breed, mm -hmm. but bam, like that in six months, all of a sudden, everyone's buying everything online from their groceries to their clothes. The physical mall is not dying. It is dead. And the consumer landscape is forever changed. And I mm. think we're seeing echoes of that same kind of change in behavior, uh, hitting the legal market and, and the, the, the stat you just cited around, uh, the the 56% of consumers that would, you know, expect legal services to be delivered virtually, Paul, that's right. exactly on point, you know, that that is, uh, I, I think, a very clear reflection of just how punctuated the shift has been. And, you know, one of my comments around the data that's being reflected back to us, by way of these legal trends report data points from from our 2020 report, you know, my commentary initially when I looked at the numbers that were coming back to us was that if, if you ask me what year this survey is from and you, you're a time traveler that could bring legal trends reports from the future back to me, I would have said this is from the year 2030 or, or beyond. You know, there, <laughs> the, the fact this is 2020 data is, is mind blowing to me. And I, I think it's incumbent on lawyers to recognize just what a profound shift this represents because the follow on questions are, do I need a physical bricks and mortar law office? Right. You know, the first lawyers to realize that the answer to that might be no, or at least the need for that office is vastly different and maybe diminish relative to its relative importance in the past uh, are going to be the ones that, that win and thrive. And, and by the way, that 56% number is a number that is only going to increase rapidly over time. You know, though, so we're already at a majority. And it's going to tip over in a really big way in the next few few months and, and years. And, and we need to, you know, I'm going to quote Wayne Gretzky here is his uh, quote about skating to where the puck is going, not where it is. That trend, that 56% is only going to grow on time and a, a, a increasing majority of consumers are going to be finding their lawyers online, interacting and transacting with their lawyers online, meeting with them over video calls. And, and, and potentially never walking into a bricks and mortar law office. So you know what they're going to walk into is this thing called the Clio app. And right. well, so, so when, when we were watching your, uh, your keynote, I listed out all the new things. You know, there's like the the Clio Manage, the Clio for Client, the partnering with Google My Business. Um, right. partnering with Zoom to do to take care of this video component. Um, so like everything is so new with you now. You're sort of, <laughs> sort of like this was this caterpillar, it's this butterfly moment for the Clio app. <laughs> um, we could go over all the new integrations, but I but I wanted to ask a dumb question. With something this robust, right? The Clio app is now this new thing. All of these integrations from tail to snout, lead generation, client management, intake. The whole thing is just robust. It's, ah, documents, put them in the app, client communication, hit it in the portal. 
How is Clio making all of that a streamlined experience and not seem like one of these malls that you were talking about earlier that has all these pop-up stands in it? Do you know what I mean? Like, I was excited about it, but I'm also wondering here, how do you guys make that this streamlined experience? And can you sort of speak to that? Yeah, it, it's a great question because the the stalking horse of every software company is death by complexity and death by feature bloat. And I think what happened to many of the the on premise software vendors of of the the past legal tech world right. um, was they they kind of got in these feature matrix wars with each other, and then mm -hmm. everyone just ended up losing because they they were in this kind of continual arms race nice. with each other. And we've taken a different approach. We, as surprising as it sounds, like we 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 don't actually pay attention to our competition at all. Really, we we just listen to our customers, mm. understand what. Uh, what challenges they're facing. Think about what the future of legal services um, can be and should be as informed by, uh, in, in a lot of ways, by our own legal trends report. If you look at our product mm -hmm. roadmap this year, there's a lot of things that dropped at ClioCon this year that if you read last year's legal trends report, you would think this, these are the technologies and the tools that consumers that want to, or the, sorry, lawyers, that want to win in this new landscape need to implement. And, and so by listening to our customers and having, I think a very clear vision of what our, the future of legal service delivery should look, should look like is, is what informs our product roadmap. And, and to answer the question you asked, I, I think the way this ties into not becoming overwhelming for our customers mm -hmm. is that we can put them on this evolutionary progression where they don't need to em embrace and adopt every piece of Clio out of the gate. You know, if you, if, if you think about almost that, uh, that, that classic diagram of the, the evolution of, of Homo sapiens from the, you know, yeah, the, arched over. Right. With know, a club slightly, uh, and then a beard. And yeah, then the there's... club and, and, right. um, and, and so on to driving you know, a Tesla species we are today, at least <laughs> right. on a good day. <laughs> right. um, you know, our, our idea is that uh, we can help usher any law firm, regardless of their starting point, through that same evolutionary journey and, and make incremental changes along the way to get there. So one mm. of the uh, one of the things we introduced in last year's legal trends report, for example, was this concept of the law firm maturity model. Mm -hmm. And and you can put yourself on that maturity model and figure out, you know, how can I improve my productivity or how can I improve my client experience and move in a really deliberate, incremental way toward that top right magic quadrant, so to speak, where you're, you know, you're a, a responsive, highly productive lawyer kind of delivering legal services in the way that we think most consumers want to consume them. But you don't need to make that in one giant quantum leap. You don't need to boil the ocean. The, the other concept that I love that we talk about in, in this year's Legal Trends Report is, is this concept of the aggregation of marginal gains. And this, right, this right. anecdote from Dave Brailsford's British cycling team where, you know, he, over the course of five years, turned this cycling team from the losingest worst cycling team on the planet they were so right. bad that sponsors didn't even want to give them bikes because they they were they were worried it would harm their brand reputation <laughs> um to sweeping the 2008 and 2012 olympics to winning the tour de france four out of five years basically building you know i think what even today is still regarded as the the best cycling team legacy that that's ever been created mm. and he did that not by you know totally transforming the team overnight but he had this concept of one percent marginal gains and mm. if you implement and james clear talks about this in his book atomic habits if you make a small incremental change that only improves something by one percent every day and you do that for a year the compounding impact of that 1% gain mm. has you 37 times better at that thing within a year. Not, you know, 37 times better, not percent better. Like just, you know, it's the magic of compounding interest, which you know, we, we all got taught in school and, 
and promptly forgot. But when you really apply that to personal improvement, and, and I just spoke to Angela Duckworth today, who, who's the right. author of Grit at Clio. Right, she right. talked about the same concept with world-class athletes. They don't go and train like crazy for a week to become Michael Phelps level performers. They work hard and get a little bit better, you know, for years at a time. And I think that's, that's the challenge for law firms is a lot of law firms look at, you know, adopting a tool like Clio from, from, from intake to invoice, you know, the full meal deal right. and feel a little bit overwhelmed. Like, oh my God, I need to change every aspect totally, of my practice. Totally. Right. But the core, the core thing here that I'm, I'm trying to express is that you can adopt a little piece of it and kind of expand elsewhere, light up a new feature here and there, and you'll eventually be able to move along that law firm maturity model and, and just embrace that incremental change and embrace the, the iterative nature that modern technology affords you. So let me, uh, so you're, I love it. And I think it's brilliant. And I totally agree. You know, Paul and, uh, Paul and I are jazz musicians. So musicians get it too. When we've been trapped in, you know, a room, you know, running scales and stuff for hours. Um, maybe it's because we were socially awkward, but I think it was because we were talented. Um, but so, but I love all that and I totally agree with it, but there's something about investing in change. And so I wanted to take the idea of investing in those marginal gains and then your, I, uh, your client centric philosophy, your latest book is all about it. Um, Clio's all about it. You know, just what you said, listening to customers, giving them the tools to get those marginal gains. We're all about it too. What's your advice to law firm owners about being invested in client centricity and not just talking about it? Because when polled, when polled, lawyers think their clients are 80% like happy with everything all the time. Right. Do right. you know what I mean? They're like the glowing reviews from those reports. Everyone talks about being client centric, but they're not investing in it. I mean, us as marketers too, you know, we're, we're asked to, you know, run the tour de France on a tricycle, you know, and they're right. like, just make it happen organically. Right. Speak to these lawyers who are, who are, who talk the client centric game, but don't invest in it. What does it mean to invest in these marginal gains, the client centric way, the philosophy, make a sandwich? Sure. So number one, the, the 80% number, I, I think, you know, it's such an important one to drill in on just as a starting point, because when we ask lawyers virtually any survey question, and, and this is true of, of people in general, not just lawyers, but mm -hmm. we've got a huge bias of the responses we give, which is the social desirability bias, right? We'll, we'll oh, yeah. give answers that we think make us sound good. Without and we see this cast in stark relief with the legal trends report when we look at Utilization rate, for example, if you ask lawyers what their utilization rate is, they will tell you about 60 or 70%. When you look at the utilization rate, the data that does not lie, the utilization rate's actually about 20%. But again, they're going to round up and maybe it's even very, you know, very, hefty very hefty rounding, very hefty rounding. That's a hefty amount of rounding. <laughs> Um, but but look, we're all guilty of it. How many times sure. a week do you sure. exercise? You, you know, seven. We all. We all round up uh, to make ourselves sound better when we're asked those survey questions. Correct. And, and, and being client-centered uh, is a great example. It's not the lawyers that you should be asking how satisfied clients are with the service they're receiving. You, you need to ask the clients. And what, what I find is one of the most interesting level set conversations I have when I'm giving a, a talk back in the days where we gave talks to auditoriums full of people. Right. I would ask law the lawyers in the audience to put up their hand and say, how many of you have heard of net promoter score, you know, and 5% tops of the audience would, would put their hands up. Okay, keep your hand up if you conduct net promoter score surveys on your clients and then all but, you know, one hand goes down and there's one, one hand up in an auditorium of 500 people right. that are asking their clients, you know, if they're a net promoter. Mm -hmm. And yet this is probably the single most important metric for a lawyer to understand if they are driving what I describe in the book as their, their law firm flywheel, you know, are, are they driving the compounding growth that a, a satisfied net promoter will drive for your law firm? 
you know, the, the thing at the heart of this is that it, it's anathema to most lawyers to ask their client, did I do a good job? And just the vulnerability that that requires when, when the lawyers are either, you know, either arrogant enough to think that, of course, I did an amazing job and, of course, the client's amazed or insecure enough. And I think that's more often the case about what they might hear back from the client. And the first step in this, this client-centered journey is, is getting over yourself almost and having the vulnerability to ask clients for feedback. That net promoter score, you need to obsess over that number. And it could be transformative if your law firm really dials in on that. Patrick Palace is one of the case studies and the Palace law firm that I, I focus on in the book that you know went through an explosive period of growth thanks to understanding where their net promoter score was when they started monitoring it, which was, was at an okay, but not great place. And then investing relentlessly in improving the processes and touch points and so on mm -hmm. in a client centered way. Wow. Uh, and they were able to get their NPS up to 60, 70 plus, which is rare air. Like this is Amazon, Apple level NPS. And does that tie to some revenue? So, so, so you got that. Does that tie to the new cases? Is that, is that, you know, a hundred percent and, and net promoter score, let me explain in a nutshell yeah, yeah, what yeah. net promoter score is for anyone that, that might be listening that may not know what it, it is. The net promoter score is sometimes described as the one question, the most important question you could ask a pers you know, somebody who has bought your services or your product from you. And the question is this. On a scale of zero to 10, how likely would you be to recommend my services to a friend or a colleague? And the people that give you nine or 10 are rated as promoters. People that give you a score between zero and six are detractors. And anyone in between is, is passive. You subtract the percentage of promoters from the percentage of detractors, and you get your net promoter score from that calculation. And what this net promoter score tells you at the end of the day is essentially how likely is somebody who's done business with you to recommend you to a colleague. And to your, to your question around, does this help drive growth? What I talk about in, in the book is this flywheel of law firm growth mm -hmm. that if you invest in it, that happy client is number one, depending on your practice here, you're gonna be a repeat client. They're gonna come back to you for more services. They're going to refer their friends to you and referrals are, you know, 50% plus of where most new clients come for most law firms. And importantly, they're going to leave positive reviews for you out there on the internet. And you mentioned Google My Business earlier. Oh, yeah. Our data shows that, you know, well over half of consumers are, are deciding on a lawyer by starting their own research. 86% of consumers are starting that research on Google. You better be thinking about what your Google reviews are. And most law firms right now don't even realize Google has reviews for, for them, you know, that, that they could be populating, they could be setting up. So this Google My Business partnership that we announced at ClioCon is such a crucial part of this, of this story because that's the, a really big piece of that law firm growth flywheel that I'm describing. And, and, and by the way, everything about that flywheel only gets amplified and gets more important when you move from the bricks and mortar physical world and move online. So you're, you're no longer you know, getting that recommendation at the local chamber of commerce meeting around who the good lawyer in town is. You're going online to find that out. And that one, that one happy customer that gave you a nine or 10 on that NPS score is gonna be able to find your next 10 clients for you. You know, they're gonna be referring their friends, they're gonna be leaving positive reviews. That, that word of mouth is just so, so key for, uh, for law firms. And all of that, by the way, like I, I think I actually dodged answering your first question, which was how do you actually start implementing, you know, this client-centered thinking and reap all of these benefits? You get that happy high NPS client by being client-centered. And really that is as simple as, understanding what your client wants, having empathy for their broader life situation that they're hiring you to help them solve. I talk in the book about the, the jobs to be done framework that Clayton Christensen Love that. helped. It's so amazing, right? Like Classic. it's such a powerful framework. Classic. But you know, nobody wakes up 
in the morning with a billable hour problem. Nobody wakes up in the morning. <laughs> You'd with... want that. Us as <laughs> yeah. marketers would love that. You'd love it. As, We're you know, outside as, their window throwing cookies in there. Sounds. Exactly. <laughs> sounds and They wake up with a life problem that they need a lawyer's help to solve and just having empathy for, you know, what is that problem and how do you design, you know, not your website, not your about me page, but how do you design your entire legal service offering from the ground up to help solve that pain point. And, and, and the example uh, that I, I used to highlight this is thinking about wills and estates law, right? If you think about a client that reaches out to you through your website and says, you know, I'm a, a 20 year old newly married person and I want a will, you know, they're not looking to spend 500 or a thousand bucks on a will, a piece of paper that they can go lock in their safe deposit box. Like when you have empathy for what that person is is hiring you for, and and more so, you know, when you apply that jobs to be done framework mm -hmm. that that the late and great Clayton Christensen gave us, you understand the job to be done. The job they're hiring you to do is to give them peace of mind, and and if they pass away unexpectedly, they have the peace of mind that their family will be taken care of. And when you you understand that, and you understand, look, peace of mind is not transactional. Peace of mind is not something that's delivered through a few sheets of paper that you put away in a locked deposit, a, a safe deposit box. Peace of mind is something that is ongoing. It's continuous. It, you know, you need to update the will continuously to reflect their new life situation. And all of a sudden, you realize, man, I shouldn't be giving a will for an hourly rate. I shouldn't be giving a will for five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for a one-time fee. I should offer a will subscription service. I should, you know, that that newly married person that came in through my website, I should offer them a $50 a year subscription service to a will. I should tell them that I'm going to send them a questionnaire once a year that asks them if anything life in their life changed. And I will update their will as part of that $50 fee for, you know, for free or included in that fee based on how their life has changed. Maybe they got uh, divorced. Maybe they had a kid. Maybe they moved states, like whatever mm. happened, mm. I will make sure that you've got that peace of mind. And the exciting thing about this client-centered thinking, thinking and where it can take you, by the way, is a win-win-win for everyone involved. So the client is paying less per year. They're, they found they're, they're getting what they wanted, which is peace of mind. And this subscription service is more affordable from a cash flow basis for them than a Five hundred or thousand dollar fee. The lawyer, although they need to get more clients in the first year to kind of help build up their business, they've got a recurring revenue stream that is stable, and the lifetime value of that client, by the way, is going to be a multiple of what an upfront fee might have been. If that client goes on and lives for thirty, fifty, a hundred years, you know, the lifetime value of that fifty dollar month subscription grows to something way bigger than. 500 or a thousand bucks up front. And, you know, I, I also think that this client-centered thinking as, um, as maybe dreamy eyed as it, as it might sound can actually do a huge amount to bridge the access to justice gap because you're helping make services that were previously inaccessible, mm. like 500 or a thousand bucks is so out of reach for so many people. We see this huge. from study after study that even a $400 unexpected expense is out of reach for most Americans. Mm -hmm. The way that legal services are priced today is out of reach for most Americans. Mm -hmm. But fifty dollars a year, you know, I spend that. I spend more than that on my Netflix subscription. I'll take care of my family for fifty bucks a year. So you can. This is the win-win-win that I'm so excited about. Is we kind of tear up all of our, you know, inertia around the the way legal services are delivered today and rethink them from the ground up. We can have happier clients that are getting their problems solved. We can have more successful lawyers making more money, helping more people in the meantime, and increasing access to justice as a side effect of all of that. You know, it sounds like, uh, you know, sounds like something worth doing. No, it's the cake and eating it too. Oh, yeah. And everyone's yeah. like, and there's icing, and then you're Whipping eating the cream, and then you're eating the table, and then the house, <laughs> but, and oh my God, they're eating it. It's everything. all edible.
You know what? You just, of- but you just perfectly. So Jake and I had a conversation the other day where we were talking about different billing models. Um, and we've had Aaron Levine on the show and and talking oh, about how I'm a Aaron super fan. Oh, she's so awesome. And and I'm her like it makes sense for what she's doing. But I didn't understand how a subscription model could be applied to different types of practices. And and it's not you're not subscribing to a law firm. You're subscribing to that peace of mind. That's what you're saying. I'm never gonna have to worry about this for 50 bucks a month or 50 that's bucks right. a year that's that's that right completely ch- i now i get it now i get it yeah. Jack. thank you you're you're, you're welcome but it, you're you know, welcome <laughs> and it, it's that right like you, you kind of take yourself out of the way we've been trained to think around you know the the fungible unit being a billable hour of time yeah and you kind of flip it on its head and think about what is the problem the client's trying to solve and how can i help solve that problem? What job am I being hired? Not as a lawyer, not as a law firm, but as a solution provider being hired to do. And, and, and what's the best delivery model for that? And look, in some cases, that's going to be a billable hour model. In some cases, that's going to be a flat rate model. But I, I would argue in a lot of cases, if you get creative about it, you can think of ways of delivering these services. Uh, Kimberly Bennett's another example Mm-hmm. Uh, that's doing a great job on this. And she does it for IP law, you know, yeah. and a- again, yep. something that doesn't on the surface seem amenable to this, but great example. Yep. Well, there's plenty, plenty of people out there. John Tobin is another one that comes to mind. John Tobin. I, I actually had him on, on my podcast uh, a couple months ago, another great example, you know, doing legal services for designers. And mm-hmm. again, these, the, these are, you know, all very unique, very disconnected use cases. But the unifying theme is if you if you take a step back and you take this client-centered approach to developing your legal services. And and look, obviously I've got a lot to say about this and I did write a whole book about this. But I in heard. a nutshell, <laughs> in a nutshell it, it's just this concept of understanding your client's needs, developing deep empathy for your clients, thinking about, every touch point they have with with you along that journey and how you can best service them along that client journey in a client centered way and realizing that this is you know ultimately not putting your clients first which is a crucial point i, I make in the book as well this is this does not mean that your law firm or your profitability or your own livelihood or your staff's well-being comes second third or fourth or fifth this mm. can be a win-win for everyone involved. You just orbit what you're doing around the client's needs, and you'll probably find that a lot of magic happens as a, a side effect of that. And you're going to be happier, by the way. You know, and, and that's oh, again, yeah. you're you're getting the cake More. and eating it too. You that's have it, it at all. <laughs> that's all of it. All right. So one thing you have to pick one thing right now to give advice to the to the JD on the street starting out, opening their firm. What's the one piece of golden Jack Newton advice for her? One, one piece of advice. I would say start with a blank canvas. I think too many lawyers start their law firms looking across the street at what, what they view as their competing lawyer, competing law firm is doing. How are they pricing? How are they packaging? What does their website say? I think what you see you know, so much of the inertia that exists in legal, I think, is, is that it's so precedent driven, not, not just, you know, in, in the courts, but in business models as well. And lawyers take the business model that they, you know, learn from whoever they apprenticed under, or whatever they can infer from the, the law firm across the street and implement that same business model. But that business model is foundationally broken. And it's not doing the job. If you look at the World Justice Project data, 77% of legal issues going unaddressed by lawyers, this massive latent legal market, this massive unmet demand, it's really clear that the 23% of demand is being met okay by some law firms doing the status quo. But don't go fight a zero-sum game with those guys over what I think is a, a shrinking market for the status quo. Go figure out, you know, this this massive opportunity by innovating and by trying new things. So tear up the playbook and start by being client centered. You know, start with a blank sheet, but start with your client and start with your ideal client profile and, and, and work out from there. 
So that's my, my one piece of advice for our fledgling lawyer. Jack, thank you so much for this. It's amazing to talk to you finally. I'm just so inspired uh, by, by the conference, by the work you guys do, the content that you put out, but your philosophy and how you invest in it. And you, I really see you making moves on... Um, you notice something in your report and you want to change it. Most people just notice something on the report and then just go and just do whatever. And you right. guys are actually taking your products and your whole network and making it something that's cohesive. And people want to be a part of this revolution. They want to get into the Clio. How can they find you online and connect with you? Yeah, join join the movement. Uh, Clio.com, uh, Clio dot com is the starting place for the website go clio is our twitter handle i'm jack at clio.com so for anyone listening that wants to shoot me a note um would love to hear from you shoot me an email i am on twitter at jack underscore newton as well so those are some good places to start five questions we ask everyone number one what was the last book you read last book i read was grit by angela duckworth again for the second time but amazing book yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Number two, what's your favorite place? Tofino, British Columbia. Nice. Number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Uh, Hacker News, the, the Y Combinator website for my tech news. The Daily for news from the New York Times and the New York Times website. Awesome. Okay. Number four, if you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Sriracha. Nice. All right, last one. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? With my wife and kids. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay lawsome. Awesome.